onto Britain's hidden blasphemy laws or less hidden. This is a spiked online piece, a uh, publication I actually really enjoyed, a little bit less so because of their uh, stance on COVID. But this was written by uh, Hardeep Singh. Now, Hardeep Singh is a great guy. I, I know him well. Um, and he is a freelance journalist, deputy director for the network of Sikh organizations, an assistant editor of the Sikh Messenger, co-authored uh, Radicalization, Islamophobia and Mistaken Identity, the Sikh Experience. He co-authored Civitas Report, We Need to Check Your Thinking, How Identity Politics is Warping Police Priorities from Within, written for The Telegraph, Spectator, Spy, Quillette, Critic, along with many others. And he is a very learned individual, has often looked at the historical clashes that there have been between um, between hit, uh, Islam and Sikhs. Uh, a lot of work in that. But this is, of course, we thought we had got rid of our, our blasphemy laws. Um, but no. So what exactly is Islamophobia? I'll touch on that and then we'll come back to uh, to this report, which pulls a lot of things from this great Civitas report, uh, one of the very good think tanks, right? well, a few good think tanks actually in Westminster. But Islamophobia, so the House of Commons, they actually put together a 23-page research, research briefing uh, titled Definition of Islamophobia. I don't know why you need 23 pages, but anyway, 23 pages to define... Shouldn't it just be like a single page, <laughs> a single sentence, in fact, that just says, don't like them, simple as. But the 23... Uh, I don't know any other word that needs 23 pages to define it, but... People get paid to write this oh, up. Yeah. Some useless bureaucratic assistant somewhere got paid to write up 23 pages of this utter bilch. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. It, it is... it is a good grift if you can get it. It, it is, it is. And they write, they write good articles on different pieces of legislation. And I know from the... Um, from Lord Pearson, working with him. And it is helpful. You can actually ask the library to write a piece on a bill going through or something to help you understand it. And then you have to trust the government to have told you exactly what is happening and haven't left anything out, which would never happen, of course. But this goes, this definition, this was written uh, September 2021, 20 years after 9-11. And it goes through a couple of definitions. The Runnymede was the first one that used a definition for this. In 1997, the race equality think tank, the Runnymede Trust, published the report Islamophobia, a challenge for us all, which is credited with introducing the term Islamophobia to public policy discourse in the UK. The oh, so, and there they define it um, as uh, Islamophobia refers to unfounded hostility towards Islam. I think you can have founded hostility towards any ideology, but it's only unfounded, not founded, obviously. It refers also to the to the practical consequences of such hostility in unfair discrimination against Muslim individuals and communities, and to the exclusion of Muslims from mainstream political and social affairs. I, mean, I living in living in London, coming from Northern Ireland, which is a, a a monoculture, coming to a mixed culture in London, and everyone has the same opportunities and well, in I, London. I, I always find that mixed culture, multi-culture doesn't actually, because you, you get with mixed especially, you get the idea that you're going to get all of these different cultures all chemically merging together yeah. in some kind of alchemical mix that creates something brand new. No, especially when you import people at the numbers that we have, yeah. you get segregated cultures yeah. violently grinding up against each other at the ed yeah. edges where they do connect with one another. And that's where you end up with a lot of the problems that England has, and Britain has faced over the past few years. And also, uh, this, 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 this might be a controversial take, I always think that it's pretty fair if I decide I want to choose who I get to live near. Oh, yeah. It, I, I would prefer to live near people who yeah. share my values and share my patterns of yeah. behavior. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, a wild Leo appears <laughs> and have a Pokemon <laughs> card come up. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just talking about Islamophobia and the Runnymede Trusts. Right example of what that means at the moment. Which is from this Civitat report um, on blasphemy laws. So they changed the definition of Islamophobia, so now pretty much anything you say is Islamophobia. 
Well, they've adopted it. So we've had a one seventh of British consuls have adopted it right. after it was thrown out because it was impossible and restricted on free speech, and no one knew which definition they would use. So um, the AP, yeah, the APPG on Islamic affairs, their definition, which was rejected, has now been adopted by consul after consul across the UK. And what right. could go wrong? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, what could go wrong? Let's but, find out. But on this, so this definition just. Uh, let you know where it's come from and then give you some examples. Um, the Running Me Trust says this term is not admittedly ideal, <laughs> really. Critics of it consider that its use panders to what they call political correctness, that it stifles legitimate criticism of Islam, and that it demonizes and stigmatizes anyone who wishes to engage in such criticism. I think that might have been the purpose, but anyway, to restrict all that. And then the Running Me Trust in 2017. Uh, to mark the 20th anniversary of the report, brought out another one, imaginably titled Islamophobia, still a challenge to us all. <laughs> it's um, been almost 20 <laughs> years and we've still not done anything about it. Can you believe it? But I don't think these organizations want the, a, well, it's not a problem, but they don't want the issue to go away because they exist on the issue oh, they yeah. create. That's the problem. Never, never trust anyone whose paycheck relies nope. on there being a problem to solve that problem. No. Nope. 100%. Like Ibram X. Kendi still hasn't solved racism in America. <laughs> Who would have believed that? <laughs> but in 20 years, a new report will come out. It's still with this. <laughs> um, but in turn, this report offered three explanations for the increase in anti-Muslim prejudice. Again, it's very anti-Muslim and Islamophobia. They're used interchangeably, uh, which are quite different ideas. But anyway, one is the ideology. One is the individual following the ideology. And individuals who follow an ideology are not all the same. They're individuals. But um, the, the three reasons why it gave us uh, why anti-Muslim prejudice has increased, which I don't think it has, was an increase in terrorist incidents since 2001. Then compared to 20 years ago, British Muslims are, are a larger, better organized and more settled community. That's, that sounds threatening. It <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, they're better organized. Oh, God, what does that mean? No, but the third one is there is now more data about British Muslims. None of the, there's more data, so what? People are better organized, integrated, so what? So I don't get, and why on earth would a terrorist uh, issue, why would that link to the Islamic community unless there maybe was some link behind the scenes? But anyway, we'll move on. Just don't look into uh, rates of intermarriage between first cousins and uh, birth defects as a result or anything. Oh, yes. Don't, don't look into that. So you've got these um, uh, these definitions which have appeared. Then you've got the APPG um, on, uh, was it Islamic affairs or Muslim? And um, no, so scroll down on the, on, the A, on the APPG. And there, yep, up, up, up oh, there. Uh, oh, so there you go. There. there we are. Um, in December 2018, the government was asked in a written parliamentary question in the House of Lords about the definition uh, which had come out from at the APPG, and they were asked whether it considered Islamophobia to be a form of racism. Again, this strange mix of a religious belief and racism. And if so, whether they will adopt a definition of Islamophobia comparable to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism. Why are all of these unelected bodies <laughs> have so much influence in our country, I swear? So much power. Um, and in reply, Lord Byrne of Aberystwyth, he obviously is an expert on this, stressed the government took Islamophobia very seriously and it was committed to tackling all hate. So there you go. They've taken it very seriously. Um, thankfully, they, they, this, they, they still have not used that definition. One other definition that's used in Europe, um, and we spoke about the online city bill, and that's also happening in Europe. So whatever happens in the UK, uh, the EU happily accept those restrictions. I mean, that, that's a, that's a good idea. At the same time as the online safety bill, I forget the name of it, but I know that there is a bill going through the EU yep. parliament at the moment that's giving similarly heavy-handed restrictions and regulations to um, governments over there. Which was introduced within weeks of the British one. It's as if they were talking behind the scenes. I could never believe such a thing. So in 2005, the Council of Europe, just to bring the EU in, said Islamophobia was the fear of prejudiced viewpoints towards Islam. Muslims and matters pertaining to them taking the shape of daily forms of racism and discrimination or more violent forms, Islamophobia is a violation of human rights. I get this. Well, the um, human right to not have people, what, like, look at you and think, 
your characteristics might tell me something about your behavior? What, what, what kind of human right is it? Who? It's the human right for you not to be criticized yes, or to face a the different one. opinion. I love how malleable human rights are. Wait, <laughs> I mean, I hate. I hate how <laughs> malleable human rights are, for God's sake. Whatever, I mean, I've, I've looked into it recently and bloody, uh, what, what is it? Um, Bukele in El Salvador, who locked up all of the gang members who had tattoos painted on their face that said, I'm a violent murderer of rapist gang member, uh, has been threatened by the US government and Biden saying you're violating people's human rights, so you might want to let them out if you don't want us to embargo wow. you and destroy your economy. Human rights are just, they, they don't care about the human right of you being able to live peacefully. They just care about the human rights of violent nutters who want to hurt you. That's yeah. always what ends up happening. But on this, this so this, uh, uh, by the government putting this together, this is the information that then all, all MPs or peers can read to understand legislation or, or debate happening. So Islamophobia and the law they said, there is no specific law prohibiting Islamophobia. But wh wh why are you having all this conversation? There's nothing in the law. This is, again, um, what hateful, harmful, if you disagree, um, perception. So there's no specific law uh, prohibiting Islamophobia. Uh, however, anti-Islam activity might be covered by more general legislation. And then it touches on some of the online, some of the bills that are there to stop Islamophobia, Obviously, Christian phobia doesn't exist. But um, uh, the bills, and there are the Malicious Communications Act 1988. There's a Communications Act 2003. There's Protection from Harassment Act 1997. So there are a lot of bills in place that can be used, which I guess refers a little bit back to the previous conversation. There is legislation there. Why bring in new legislation? There's reams and reams and reams, hundreds of thousands of pages of legislation of UK law that it would take somebody an entire lifetime to even get through a fraction of all of it. But basically everything that you can even think of is probably illegal if you go into the fine details of it. Well, it feels it feels like we're legislating, or the government's legislating for the sort of reaction to uh, some of the negative aspects of uh, of Islam. Yeah. Uh, so you know, terrorism, obviously. Then you know, there's there's grooming gangs. It's unfair to say, uh, or it's you know, to a certain extent to say. It's unfair to say Islam because it's certain sects, certain parts of it, yeah. creeds yeah, yeah. of Islam that are that are overrepresented in in some of these. Uh, but I mean, it's still it's still there, you know. The the link, with, but instead of like dealing with the actual issue, the government deals with the reaction yep. to the issue, which seems arse about tit. Com yeah, completely. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just a narco tyranny. But uh, one other issue that this paper brought in is the issue on reporting, which is hugely. I always grew up that if something bad happens, you call the police. You, the police were the who you trusted. And they come along and make it worse. <laughs> they can, yeah, or true. ignore you. But that was the traditional thing. Now our government have handed responsibility over to all these other organizations. They get funded by the government anyway. So Telmama is one of them where they actually have their own reporting system. So actually, you don't have to go to the police. You can go to someone else. Well, why would you go to someone else? Why would you not just go to the police? And that uh, passing on of responsibility uh, is, is a curious move away from what we've traditionally had. Um, the police, I, they don't take any personal responsibility that anyway, but to pass it over to another organization that no one actually knows much about yeah, exactly. is dangerous. The police are, you know, under the, the government's sort of Freedom of Information uh, Act, they, they try and make data as available and they, they've got uh, they've got people overseeing them and making sure that they're not they're not sort of doing anything wrong. Whereas some like Tell Mama, yep. they don't have anywhere near that level of nope. oversight. And in fact in the in the aftermath of uh, Boris Johnson's uh, column where he, he wrote and he compared he compared uh, Muslim women to, to letter boxes. I mean, it was a it was a cheap uh, it was a cheap gag, uh, but it wasn't. There was no hateful intent. In fact, yeah. the, the the content of the article, the gist of the article, was was trying to increase tolerance and saying, "Hey, like yeah. you know, what, these women should be allowed to wear burqas and stuff." Uh, so it was a it was a pro Muslim column. Yeah. Uh, but Tell Mama said that there was a, this surge in uh, in hate crime against Muslims in the fall. But if you looked at it. It was just phone calls to them, and there's no oversight. There's no, oh, yeah, and, it and it's very small numbers. Wasn't to it start about off with? Thirty people phoned into them and, and started whining about it and started weeping yeah. over the phone. I can't believe he wrote this. Yeah, Boris Johnson, one of the wettest men in the UK, <laughs> said something slightly mean about me. Maybe, yeah. and we don't know if it's because uh, you know, like Amazon reviews. 
people can, you know, organize <laughs> yeah. organize their mates to leave nice reviews. We don't we don't know if it's, yeah. if it's that the same guy. Like, yeah. It's not the thirty four voices. Yeah. <laughs> But that gives a background. Uh, I'll touch on the the story that I think explains the chaos and confusion and the mess that this definition of Islamophobia uh, has produced. And of course, the hate crime legislation and all the industry that's basically built up around that. But also in the, the Telegraph, they had this again, one in seven councils adopts Islamophobia definition uh, rejected. Uh, there you go. One in seven conscious. And this, it was in the Telegraph, was spiked. It was a couple of other places. Um, I bet one of them was Birmingham. Well, it, it could, yes, could be. Although they're, they're going out of business at the moment. The, the, the moss fits in well in the, in the tower blocks there. But um, so some of the points they brought out were one in seven consuls adopt the APPG Islamophobia definition from 2019, which is Islamophobia as a type of racism the targeted expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. If if I was a Muslim, I'd be quite angry that I was just stuck together with everyone else who called themselves a Muslim. I mean, as a Christian, I, I meet other Christians so different, different beliefs, different understandings, look different. But here, Muslims are all the same. But if you were a Muslim and understood that whether or not you're getting lumped in with a lot of people you necessarily don't identify with, but the broader definition means that as a rule, you will be getting benefits and pre uh, preferential treatment <laughs> from the people who are, who are administering your local geographic area. Yep. It probably would take away some of the sting. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. My mate's, my mate's brother was in uh, prison for um, cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> cocaine <laughs> and uh, so, like, you know, he was trying to get a better time in prison. Scotland so, knows prison inmates. <laughs> his, his mate said, well, he's, he's from London. But his mate said, uh, say you're Muslim, so then you, then you get better food. You get, instead of just getting like a horrible, nasty, dried up bit of bacon, oh, yeah, you, yeah. Get, you get like, you know, the, you get the, the lamb curries and all that sort of stuff. So he's like, yeah, I'm a Muslim. So, you know, I'm, they give him the curries and stuff. And then he goes down for lunch one day. And he's like, yeah, brilliant. What's for lunch? And uh, they're like, it's Ramadan. And he's like, what's, Ram <laughs> what's Ramadan? Oh, no. Is that, is that a type of curry? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Lamb Ramadan. Oh, I ruined the grid. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know. <laughs> oh, dear. Mission oh. failed, boys. Better look next time. Um, but yeah, on to this less comical side. The, so the one in seven adopt it. Uh, the government, again, the government initially had rejected this. Uh, so Civitas found out there were 52 local authorities in England have passed a motion to adopt the definition, even though it's been uh, rejected by the government, uh, one in seven. Uh, and then in the foreword to the Civitas report, uh, Charles Moore says, freedom of religion is rightly defended, but so must freedom of speech be. Freedom of speech is bound to involve the criticism of religion in general and sometimes of particular religions. All religions make certain truth claims. In a free society, people must be free to challenge these claims. To argue the criticism of Muslim ideas as a form of racism is in most cases a profound mistake. If only the government would listen to some sensible person like Charles Moore, but no, they don't. Um, and a spokesman for the Muslim Council of Britain have, of course, accused of a task report of willfully misrepresenting the APPG on British Muslims' definition of Islamophobia. The definition is widespread support, uh, maybe amongst APPG people or maybe amongst uh, the Muslim Council of Britain, uh, and has been adopted by most national political parties outside the Conservative Party, which is once again marred in accusations of institutional Islamophobia. Apart from the part where they import all of the Muslims into the country. Oh, yeah. We're just going to ignore that part because Suella Braverman occasionally makes noises like she wants to deport a few of the illegal ones. Yeah. So let, there are just two or three little stories uh, we will uh, refer to. This is the report, Islamophobia, um, and it is a, a great read, Hardeep, a great journalist, uh, has done a fantastic job in highlighting uh, the councils adopting things that actually many of the government don't think are beneficial. Now, how has Islamophobia been used? So this led me down another rabbit hole of looking around the scene just in the last few weeks. So this is, I still get confused when I see X, Twitter, uh, should answer to Queensland authorities over Islamophobic tweets by an American, sorry, by an American tribunal hears. This is intriguing because Queensland, so 
It says that Queensland authorities should be able to hold Twitter responsible for the Islamic tweets of an American white supremacist, of course, threw that in, uh, because they were downloaded in the state and accused harm, caused harm to local Muslims, a tribunal has heard. Not sure necessarily why. Is this the same way that uh, building a bridge over your river harms the local Aboriginal <laughs> in Australia? It probably is, isn't it? It's, it's the same thinking. Um, at a hearing... Uh, before the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, QCAT. On Tuesday, lawyers uh, for both sides argued whether Queensland authorities had legal jurisdiction to rule in this matter. Uh, Merkel, which is the, the people bringing it, argued the tweets were downloaded in Queensland and had caused harm to local Muslims. Uh, it says Twitter, or X Corp, is a true foreign corporation with no presence in Australia. And um, If they are successful, this was from Twitter's lawyers, that would give Queensland the widest jurisdiction of any entity in Australia and possibly the world. <laughs> it's not enough to say there is there is an effect in Queensland. It's clear that Twitter is not a person in Queensland under the legislation. Um, and then it goes, so um, I just need to read this. So the, the lawyers, Aman, the lawyers who brought this, um, they originally demanded an apology from Twitter for the dehumanizing content which included a reply that the Quran should be referred to as the terrorist handbook. So we've You're... just been banned in Queensland. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I hope you don't have many followers in Queensland. That's messed that up. But um, it's people should be allowed to critique and mock and ridicule a religion, a book. Um, Christianity is open to ridicule and has been forever. Uh, well, that's, that's one of the things that was most effective in, um, in, in like you say, ridiculing Christianity and reducing belief in it is if you get the permission to ridicule something, that's one of the most effective ways of delegitimizing it. And so if you're trying to protect something, one of the best ways you can do it is to just stop people being able to joke about it in the first yeah. place. Yeah. Because there's there's very few ways of being able to respond properly to someone just mocking you. Yeah. Especially if they're dedicated to not responding seriously. Oh, completely. So this is the UN General Assembly has has just been on, and this is the headline: Xenophobia, Islamophobia have reached intolerable levels. Erdogan tells UN, "It's wonderful that Turkey are now advising us on human rights and what is good and not." But he said, <laughs> "Populist politicians in many countries continue to play with fire by encouraging these dangerous trends." Warns Turk's leader. I think this is just a, a dangerous move from. Often Islamic countries where there is a different understanding of freedom and rights, yeah. uh, telling the West that have absolute rights how we should and should not be, be doing things. There are two different ideas of how you run a country, of how people work together. Um, mm. They're entitled to, to their viewpoint. But again, it's these trigger words that are used. Which and also, again also if you down. look at like Islamic countries... They tend not to be like oases of uh, of tolerance and happiness and and <laughs> uh, you know well functioning economies. They tend to be like Iran. I mean, Turkey's Turkey's probably the best example of an Islam, yes. but it's I guess it's a secular country. Um, yeah, if you look across the Middle East and uh, and countries that are that are going more more Islamified in in Southeast Asia, it's uh, it's not a panacea. No. I've got a really great idea, guys, and this is advice to anybody in Iran or Turkey or an Erdogan, if you're watching this. Is or Queensland. Or Queensland. <laughs> yeah. If these countries are just far too dangerous, clearly there's so much hate bubbling just beneath the surface of England and the West. So dangerous for these people to come over here because they're just going to be assaulted in the street by people's nasty words and verbiage. Uh, they just don't have to come here. If you're so, so, if you're so scared, just look, okay, don't come here. If I... If I'm walking over to the dog pound and all of the dogs are barking at the door, waiting for me to come through so they can tear me apart, I look at that and go, nah, <laughs> nah I won't go in there. I'll avoid that, actually. So there's just a suggestion. But then on the other hand, uh, the only thing that's going to stop uh, your kids being transitioned is more Muslims coming over and joining yeah. school boards. <laughs> that is the only thing that's going to stop it. The only thing that's going to stop you being forced no, to well, dance naked in roller skates at a pride parade is the Islamification of Britain. No. But does that <laughs> not happen watched, in Muslim have countries? Have you been watching Andrew Tate recently? <laughs> Why, what's Andrew Tate been saying? He's Muslim, that, that exact same thing. Right. Along with a few others, really. Right. Yeah. Same with, uh, what's his brother, Tristan Tate? They've both yeah. been saying that the only thing that's going to save the West is Islam. Nah. But this, this nah, we can save it without that. Cheers. 
Erdogan's criticism of uh, of the West is is working. Like Denmark uh, outlawed yep. Quran burning, yep. uh, whereas Sweden is uh, is still allowing it. But once you outlaw it, that's I mean, where does that stop? Like I could say, you know, this this bit of paper that I've written stuff on. Well, that's holy. That's that's my that's my religion. And then all of a sudden, you're not well, allowed to criticize that or the burn it. Abo situation then. The what? The Australian Aboriginal situation then. No. <laughs> no, I haven't. Where, where over there they can just say that something is holy and you're not allowed to touch it. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I, I don't, that one didn't pass through, or at least it got repealed within about a month of it yeah. coming in. But their initial plan but, but was, what's the well, we say, it's, we say it's holy, so you can't do anything. But what's the difference between that and, you know, how, how do you distinguish what, what a valid religion is? Like the Church of Leoism is, in my view, just as valid as, you know, Mormonism, Islamism. Well, how politically expedient is it for the government to support you? It's uh, no, I don't think the government does want to support me. <laughs> there, you go. there it is. Unless, unless it's with job seekers' allowance. <laughs> but it's, it's true. Then what children's fairy tale books are given protection because one person's religion is is another person's nonsense. So, um, yeah, I guess any fairy tale book could be classed as a belief or religious yeah. belief, and then gets protected. And if you burn any of those fairy tale books, then you could be in prison yep. for doing that. Yep. There are just two. This was, um, again, looking at so that UN General Assembly, and there were a number of other uh, great leaders who spoke, Turkey, Iran, Qatar. Uh, and it's interesting, this story, they said, which is this confusion, I think, the left have in putting these different sources of rights together, competing rights. Their line was, an Iraqi refugee, Salwan Momika, triggered international outrage by burning and trampling on the Quran in front of Stockholm's largest mosque on Ed Eid Adha, a significant Muslim holiday. Now, I don't know whether the issue is whether he was an Iraqi or a refugee or he did it on a holiday or what it was, but all those things uh, mix in. You think of the Iranian president, like a bastion of freedom, held up a Quran at the UN podium and emphasized that disrespect towards the holy book would not diminish its divine truth. Well, he can believe something is true, but people should be able to critique and mock it. Um, and then the Prince of Qatar uh, emphasized the, the sanctity of the Quran, which, of course, is completely free to if that's what he believes. And the final thing, bringing it back here to the, the mayoral elections in London, Tory mayoral candidate like Enoch Powell Post. Now, this brings in Age. Islamophobia. And I was curious to see what exactly was in this, because it must be something awful that she has said. Um, and not really. She it linked stuff that she'd said about Enoch Powell to Islamophobia. So the concerns they have are one message and this is dangerous stuff, so anyone watching who's a bit squeamish, one message picturing a uh, had a picture of Enoch Powell read, it's never too late to get London back. It's, it's true. It's, it's, is that hurtful or offensive? Or, uh, I don't think it is true. I think, I think, it, it, I think it, is. it is too late. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I, I, was speaking, I was speaking to Josh about this, and there are uh, peaceful ways that don't require fiery rhetoric and other things to make it so that populations who have recently emigrated to the UK mm. will leave the country of their own but terms. I don't think peacefully. people need to leave the country. I think it's a, a cultural thing. Yeah. It's um like the we see so many people that have come to the UK or their, their ancestors came to the UK, like um uh, Rishi Sunak, for example, who's now a classic Englishman. He's, you know, I mean, he's got yeah. the, he's got the same values, and I don't know. For me, I guess everybody's, everybody's different. But for me, it's uh, like Rishi Sunak, who is planning on moving to the U.S. right before he became prime minister. <laughs> Again, a very British and, thing to and, do, and, and who, when he loses the it's, next election, will definitely move to it's the U.S. Very British. And drop his citizenship. It's very British to want a better life for yourself and live in a better place. So I can totally understand. Is it very British to want to import millions of Indians into the country? Well, it has been for the last like 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's a British policy. <laughs> but yeah, but I think cultural, like once uh, people are here, what, like if, if they absorb and exude British values, 
I'm to- I'm I'm pretty much cool with that. It's when people come and form ghettos, and we yeah. have you know under Blair's policy of multiculturalism yeah. with faith schools and everybody uh, you know siloed in their own communities, and there's no challenging allowed of of you know like the ideologies you're you're talking about. Then you know those those uh, differences fester, and in fact, people you know cling to those ideas harder than they would if they'd stayed in you know Pakistan or or wherever. Let me just fit the, she gave other tweets, and this is this is hard stuff to take. So um, again, I hope everyone's really listening to this. Um, she suggested that Enoch Powell should have been prime minister, and asked for politi- for him to be added to a pack of cards featuring pictures of former prime ministers. So Quite th- quaint, really, isn't uh, it? This is what Hope Not Head have found. This is what they have oh, wow. found. I mean, e- Enoch Powell literally was the most popular politician yeah, of yeah. his time who was only prevented yeah. from running yeah. because the conservat- his own party yeah. kicked him out yeah. and persecuted him for saying things that turned out to be absolutely accurate. In fact, he was Completely. underestimating the numbers yeah. that would end up happening 50 years down the line. He was too optimistic. Yeah, if a politician had come out in the, you know, 50s, 60s or 70s and, you know, said, yeah, by, you know, whatever time, you know, uh, what the white British population is going to be uh, the minority in London, people would have been, you're, people would have said, you're the most ridiculous, mm-hmm. racist, alarmist person in the world. Uh, yeah, actually... Yep. Here we are. <laughs> she, she, the last one she gave, which I think is the most uh, shocking of it all, she thanked Kitty Hopkins for a post in which Hopkins had referred to Sadiq Khan as the nipple height mayor of London, Astan. <laughs> I thought that was the, the best. But for anyone, don't worry, coming up is, if you've missed it this year and weren't able to celebrate, 15th of March, 2024. International Day to Combat Islamophobia, a UN day. So I just leave that that little bit of hope that people can look forward to in six months. I was worried. I was worried I wouldn't be able to get cel- uh, celebrate it next year, but thank you. That's okay. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site, such as the premium articles, this one on the SMP's failing war on biological reality, with an audio track for silver and gold tiers. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Getter at lotusetus underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.